Hi, Mr. President. Yeah, right. um, it's also the coordinator of the Bachelor and Master uh, of the department. And his research interests range from uh, effects of social and physical environment on behavior, uh, attitudes and emotions to behavior and sustainability. So it's quite wide. Uh, he has written too many articles to mention here. And uh, in what these are, in one of the magazines. Please welcome. I think it's better to use the microphone. I'm a bit harsh because I had a flu like so many other people. Well, thank you for your uh, attention today. Uh, you should notice this uh, lecture and the topic of this lecture is really my favorite topic. So I was very glad that my line invited me to come over and give a talk here at the Technical University at the Architecture Department to show you what psychology can do uh, in combination with designers. Um, that was not my talk. What drives the architects in general? I'll talk briefly about what architects do, what their aspirations are, what the products are, and of course where the psychology coming in. The combination of what you're looking for. I'll talk <coughs> briefly a bit about theories. The time is limited at 40 minutes instead of an hour, which I originally thought. So briefly about theory, and then especially the focus of my, pay, my uh, contribution to the lecture will be about a number of studies that I think are very worthwhile knowing because there, what was achieved there in those studies is what uh, psychologists and architects should look for. Really useful, interesting, in-depth knowledge about what people do in their environments, how the design of the environment can contribute to their well-being. But that's uh, on the core of the, of the lecture, like the five stuff. Yeah. So, architects and users. We, uh, when coming in, I had a, a brief talk with some of you, and uh, well, the first topic that came up was what architects are doing and why they're doing it and what their uh, most uh, deep motivations are. So, what do they want to do? What are their aspirations? Do they want to serve the users, or what? Do they have their own needs, their own preoccupations? Um, well. I quoted some work from uh, Bob Gifford from his book Environment Psychology, Principles and Practice, and he is quite severe on well designers and architects. He says many architects have a focus and orientation on aesthetics and their own kind of aesthetics. They have a love for technology, they want to be innovative, they want to use the state of the art technology. They uh, aspire professional recognition, of course, more than the recognition from the users of their environments. And, unfortunately, they have a lot of untested assumptions of what users may find important. And the point is, of course, that those untested assumptions, they're not keen on testing them. But, that's exactly where psychology comes in then. Understanding is the key. Uh, well, briefly about aesthetics from a psychological point of view, and then, again, briefly about well-being, stress, restoration. First on aesthetics, uh, it's a kind of anthology of three important theories, again, very briefly, with uh, some nice examples, I hope. The first one is, is an old one, maybe in one of the previous lectures, <coughs> his name has been mentioned before, Daniel Berlin, he had in the 70s, well, uh, a main goal of trying to understand aesthetic experience from a psychological point of view. <coughs> and he has achieved some really noteworthy things. And the main of them is the most, the best known for his work on what's called, what he called, cognitive properties. He argued that people in the, in the field of simulation, the stimulus field, are looking for information. Uh, what is offered is just well, a lot of Sensory, sensory stimuli, of course, but organizing that, the, the, the possibility to organize those uh, elements in the stimulus field, that's what makes it meaningful and that's what could, it could make uh, beautiful. Cognitive properties are, well, the whole of that. Cognitive properties are um, what uh, the elements that you compare from one to the other within the field or between different, between different uh, scenes one after the other. So 
what you can do in the field is looking for order, looking for complexity, looking for congruity, looking for diversity. If you perceive, if you succeed as a perceiver, then the aesthetic experience is evolved. That is also true for well, success of stimuli, one following one after another. Newness or surprises may also evoke an aesthetic experience. Some examples. Order is one of the most prevalent means of uh, achieving uh, organization within the field. And symmetry is a, well, a very striking kind of order, of course. Complexity. Complexity is unorganized uh, stimulation. This one is a good example of complexity. <coughs> it's also called complexity. It's a famous painting by Jackson Paul. But uh, well, remarkable is that it's not possible to predict uh, from one part of this scene what an other part would look like. So there's no, no order, no unity, no way of knowing parts of the field from another part of the field. That is not the case in well, this example. Organized complexity. You see a lot of information, a lot of details, but in a very organized manner. So that's very different from unorganized complexity. And this may evoke for many people a very strong experience of uh, beauty, more so than the early one. Anyway, look at this. Isn't that surprising? And do you think that's beautiful or interesting at least? <coughs> this is an example of this uh, temporal cognitive st property succession of stimuli one after the other. It's very well, uncommon to see a building like this, like well, looking like almost like a whale in a well traditional quarter, residential quarter. It's a very famous museum. New. Um, this work of Berlin led to new work of which uh, a few people sent out. There's a couple in the United States in, in Harvard. Rachel and Stephen Kaplan have been very, very influential in this field, and they well started more or less with the ideas of Berlin to continue that in in a way that focuses more a little bit more on behavior. Berlin is on perception. Sorry. Berlin is on perception. Kaplan and Kaplan is more on it's also on perception, preference, beauty, also on uh, options to. Uh, obvious for behavior. That's uh, well the main background of their model. It's a famous model, very often quoted. Uh, what it says here is that uh, people have a need for understanding and a need for exploration. Both that they have that with regard to the uh, stimulus field as a scene, as a, a picture. But uh, right away they start thinking about how it would be to enter that specific environment on how do we to function within that environment, to go into, come back, and so on. So that produces four dimensions of aesthetic experience, preference, coherence, like order, diversity, details, richness, and then for the behavioral, more future orientation, legibility, how would it be to enter the scene, would you be able to come back, and mystery, Mystery is not as mysterious as it looks like, but it's in their definition the, the promise of further information. These are some examples I collected for each of the dimensions. Coherence is order, things together. Diversity, many elements, but in an organized way. Legibility, well, their definition, well-structured space within uh, with distinct elements so that it's easy both to find its way into the scene and back. And then mystery, the problems of further information. How would it be to walk along that stream and turn the corner and what would it look like there? That's the essence of mystery. That's very shortly about uh, Kaplan Kaplan's preference matrix. There's also another, uh, another view on beauty, pleasure, preference that's coming from current psychology, 
that focuses on, on the way people categorize elements, scenes, information, um, well, uh, bundle that or bring that to a higher level of abstraction. That uh, has resulted in, well, in fact, two theories about the relationship between what's called prototypicality and preference. Prototypicality stands for, well, the unique essence of, well, some sort of environment in this case, a building, uh, a scene, whatever. The, the more, and then the prediction is that the more this category of environment, like a church building, for example, looks like the prototypical <coughs> church, the more it will be preferred. Um, the competing version of that same theory, building on the same elements anyway, is that uh, a building that deviates slightly from the prototypical in your head, the prototype in your head, is the most preferred because then it arouses uh, attraction, interest, more than the real prototypical uh, object itself. So this is also well, a way of looking at uh, reference, of looking at the way people uh, see the environment and derive pleasure from it. <coughs> There's also work on the combination of both this work, uh, the Kaplan's work, with the four dimensions and the prototypicality or, uh, orientation. I'm not going to that now, but now you have a view of what's going on. What <coughs> kinds of ways psychologists have to looking at reference, analyzing reference. Um, okay, then, a slightly different topic, a second topic. It's not on aesthetics necessarily, it's about other needs that people may have. Uh, stress, people who are stressed, people who are mentally fatigued. What do they need in terms of environmental support? Well, uh, to be very brief about that, there are two leading theories. One is called the psychoevolutionary theory of Ulrich, stress reduction theory, that focuses mainly on effect, on affective experiences. Um, Stress is the, 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 the catch or the main topic. The other one, again by this, this famous couple, Kaplan and Kaplan, in newer work, focuses on a, a different concept. Uh, they call it attention restoration theory, and it is about the way people devote, have to devote attention to what's going on, to their work, to their direct environment, to traffic, or whatever. Uh, the necessity to focus and well, the fatigue that derives from that. Uh, how do people deal with that? What are the symptoms? Can environments be de designed or be found where people can recover from this mental fatigue? So this, those, those two years are leading in uh, well, examples that we discuss right now. Five nice studies that I think are exemplary for the work that can be done within psychology uh, in interaction with designers and architects. <coughs> First one is old and probably you know it, you may know it, not sure of course, but this is a work that at the time aroused a lot of attention. It's a study about Ulrich and published in science, so very well a uh, renowned uh, scientific journal and he came up with something uh, very unexpected. He just looked at the view. He had people, um, well, I should be a little bit more systematic in my way of present, presenting the study. <laughs> it was a study, an archival study of patients recovering from gallbladder surgery. Uh, the period of recovery was set. He had the records from 72 to 81, and it took such a long time because he was very strict in finding people who were comparable. They were matched on age, sex, smoking habits, obesity, hospitalization history, floral level, level room color, all of that was controlled for and matched. And what came out of the treatment that he was looking for uh, was quite spectacular. The treatment was in, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. the view. What did those patients see from the windows? Did they have a view of the park? It was close by. 
or were they just able to see this big wall? Well, that was the, well, the experimental manipulation in retrospect and from these archival uh, archives. What he found was spectacular. And especially the first uh, variable, the number of days of hospitalization after surgery. People with a tree view were there for well, almost eight days recovering. People with a wall view were there for almost nine days. So you can imagine how much it differs in costs of hospitalization. And the other criteria were also encouraging, uh, supportive of the, the idea that the tree view is helpful in recovery. Uh, the patient needed fewer medication. They um, had fewer minor complications. The notes of the nurses treating them show that they had less problems and were in better moods. Fewer negative notes. <coughs> it's a bit mixed up, but uh, I guess you can find out what uh, what I mean. So that was a spectacular effect, which in fact has driven a whole program of research from then, and a program that recently has become very, very popular and influential. There's a lot of research coming out on rest restoration, restorative environments, restorative treatments, anyway. Um, a second one, also on this uh, effect of nature, but from a th different theoretical framework. This is from the mental fatigue framework, attention restoration. Again, a pretty spectacular study. It was done in Chicago, in places that well, had a poor reputation. A housing development that uh, was built for the poor, and that had, well, it showed. It started from the premise that life in the inner city is taxing, especially for the less privileged, because they live in poor quality housing. Uh, they have fewer resources because their income is low, they live in crowded conditions. Uh, well, all these unfavorable circumstances lead, among others, could lead, among others, that was the main hypothesis, to mental fatigue. This worrying, uh, all this thinking, all this well, anticipating on well, problems might very well create mental fatigue, according to the investigators. So, here it is, mental fatigue reduces inhibition, increases aggression. It's one of the well, consequences of being mentally fatigued. Could be that uh, um, self-regulation decreases, that it's more difficult to control yourself. So you're more inclined to impulsive behavior and possibly to aggression. Um, the idea of the uh, research was in line with the framework, attention restoration theory, that nature might play a role in this phenomenon. So what did they do? They did a very, very careful study. They had the privilege, in a way, they had a very strong advantage that they could do their research in what was, were the Robert Taylor homes. That's well, a, a housing development in Chicago, um, run by an agency that uh, distributes the apartments in a random way. So people, future residents were allocated to one of the buildings. And the buildings were identical, the apartments were identical, but the direct environment, the immediate environment was different in the sense that some were surrounded by nature, and others were just standing down on a barren slab of asphalt. So the direct environment and the views from the apartments are different, and the fact that those people were allocated to one or the other building on a, in a random fashion meant that this was a true experiment, that which is something that you can hardly achieve in well, life uh, in a field study. It's almost impossible to do a true experiment with random assignment of people to conditions in well, real life. This was the, the exception. Uh, so, what kind of people live, lived at the time, in that kind of apartment? Fairly young people, mostly women, Divorced women with quite a number of children, average three children, and a very low household income. So those single mothers had to deal with a lot of things and a lot of uh, difficulties. 
did that work out as predicted? That's the main question, of course. Um, uh, the researchers were very careful. They have independent readers assess the amount of nature visible from the views of the apartment. They had very well tested, uh, very well trained interviewers because these were delicate things and a difficult group to interview. So those were women mostly, very well trained in advance. And they had questionnaires asking for aggression. Uh, the com conflict tactic scale is one of the uh, aggression measures. They also looked at well, the degree of attention of fatigue, the attention of capacity of those people by what's called uh, digit pen backwards. It's a test of well, how well you can repeat things, how well you can memorize numbers and repeat. <coughs> What came out was so as expected that the question was less in the building surrounded by some nature towards the partner, towards the children. Uh, so that was one of the assumptions that was uh, on the hypothesis that was uh, validated. The other one, the, the importance of mental fatigue, attention to functioning, was uh, confirmed as well. Those digits went backwards, scores, well, attention and capacity was lower in the known age condition. It was related to aggression and it mediated the nature, non nature, aggression relation. So apparently, this attentional functioning, attention capacity, is indeed something responsible for the aggression in the buildings that are not surrounded by nature. So apparently, nature had a good role for those people. Lucky for you to be in well, the better build construction. In, uh, well, let's say this building as compared to this building. Okay, then over not to nature to uh, material design elements. This is a study by one of the main researchers, I think the top research on environmental stress, Gary Evans and colleagues. It's an older study, but one that's well, very uh, useful to discuss, very interesting because it's so clear and it has such a very outspoken uh, part of well, the, the physical part of the interior. Uh, what Evans and colleagues did uh, was arguing that uh, high density, so many people in, within an apartment, may lead to psychological distress. It's stressing to be surrounded by other people all the time. It may lead to social withdrawal. It's uh, you know, paradoxical. Being surrounded by so many people uh, enforces, reinforces the need for withdrawal, to not interact with all those people around. Um, identity in the home disturbs the, so the, the supportive relationship that people may have with each other within the home. <coughs> There's very little on this at the time. It's still, that's still the case, but certainly in '95. So there's not so much interior design and crowding. And he argues that the main hypothesis is the fact that the floor plan may influence social interaction patterns within the home. So it's not the size of the home, but it's a floor plan. In his uh, hypothesis, what is meant with the door, the floor plan? He goes to, well, architectural theory. Maybe some of you are familiar with it, space syntax. And one of the concepts from space syntax is what's called depth. That is the number of spaces one must go through from one place to the next. Uh, so imagine this person here standing at the door. If he wants to go to this bedroom, he has two barriers to cross, this door and this one. So that, that's a depth of two. It's a very simplified uh, scheme, of course, but that's the idea. If this person should go to this bathroom here, he has a, that has a depth of three. It's this one, it's this one, it's this one. This way you can generate a score for an apartment, an, an average score. And that's what he uses in his analysis. His hypothesis are that greater depths for greater opportunities to regulate social interaction, the opportunity to control interaction 
is increased by increased death, which should lead to less social withdrawal and to less loss of social support to social withdrawal in the high density homes that he studied. So it's a complex hypothesis. This is the scheme. It's an interaction mediated, it's, well, it's uh, vaguely figured, it's um, mediated moderation. It's a, an interaction effect of density and depth, but it may lead, the interaction, so the, the combination of those two may lead to social withdrawal, which in turn may lead to psychological distress. But it's not one of those uh, variables in itself, but the combination. Um, again, some methodological information. That's calculated from the floor plan. Density, number of persons per room, average for each apartment. Uh, good, solid scales to investigate those experiences, the social withdrawal scale, and a famous stress scale. All of that was uh, perfectly all right. And what did we find? We found a pattern of stress scores that was in line with his expectations. Uh, as you can see here, yeah, death, high and low, density, low and high, I should say. And what stands out is this a combination of high density, low depth, has substantially higher scores than each of the other conditions. So only in that case, uh, stress not appears, but is substantially higher than in the other conditions, which is an interaction effect, statistical inter interaction effect. <coughs> so that looked like one of the hypotheses uh, was confirmed, and then the other one, the mediated moderation effect, well, in fact, that was confirmed as well. Here are the, well, the B weights in the regression analysis, past analysis, saying that Yes, it's the combination, those two in combination, that influence social withdrawal, which in turn influences psychological distress. So, interesting to see that this depth phenomenon, the number of doors, barriers in an apartment can play such an important role. That's the lesson of the Evan study. Again, stress due to high density can be prevented by death. And ease of control, that's the explanation, of course, reduces withdrawal, which leads in a way to a sort of a paradoxical effect that people have better and more supportive relationships when the environment facilitates to be alone. It's not something, it's not something that you would think of in advance, I would say. But somewhat counterintuitive, but perfectly, it makes perfect sense seeing those analyses. Um, okay, so far for the work with Gary Evans and the study that I did recently with a colleague, Mieke Wenig, published two years ago, I think, and recently. Uh, we were asked to do uh, an evaluation study of. Um, of a relatively minor operation in a care home. Uh, people were unhappy there. Uh, was, uh, well, the interior was old, it was worn, and there were ideas about what could be done to improve not only the aesthetics, but also the functioning of that building for its inhabitants, old people. And uh, we had some premises with that say, in, well, agreement with the designers, the interior designers. Um, some things that are factual, something that look very probable, and what's factual is that those people, those very old people, it's not people with dementia, you know, it's people that are just very old, cannot live in a home anymore, but don't have severe handicaps, mental or physical, it's just that they are limited. Uh, they have an average age, I'll show you, of 86 years, so it's really old people. Uh, what they do is Oh, you could call it not so much, but they would spend, anyway, they spend much of the time indoors, in their, in their homes, in their buildings. And a lot of the time they, they spend in the communal areas. They have a recreation area, a 
and the lobby that are public, semi public, and that are very important to them. Social interaction is tremendously important. We quote another artist saying that talking is probably the most uh, practiced activity of those people. Talking. <coughs> And the third one, they have very little control over their physical environment. So they are not the ones who decided uh, what the building should look like, what can be done where, and so on. Um, so what was proposed, there were two, we looked at two uh, public areas in the building, the lobby and the recreation room. The, the, I had the best pictures for the lobby, so I'll show what happened there. What they wanted to do in the lobby was Changing the coloring, lighter, more cheerful. Uh, furniture that was more maneuverable and that was or looked more natural. And they wanted to create some places where privacy was easier to control, to maintain. This is what it looked like before the renovation. Rather heavy furniture, dark, <coughs> not very exciting. And then the new interior with lighter, more natural uh, furniture on the one hand, and it's probably the most important part of this lobby now, the new version of the lobby, are those well, boots, where you, well, semi-boots, where you had uh, sort of a natural arrangement of furniture that invited people, groups, small groups, together and to have achieved some privacy. <coughs> um, we looked at well a number of things, but here are some of the important, uh, all the important scores and the important variables that we looked at. Aesthetic quality, controlled interaction. How did people feel that they were in control and not in control in that particular uh, environment, that lobby? Um, how much did they use it before and after? And what's more spectacular, what? did it to their, well, their experience of subjective well-being. Subjective well-being is, a, is an important and very general measure, of course, of well, how people well, stand in life, what, uh, how they feel, how, they, how well they feel. Um, as you can see, well, the design was rather successful for the small group. As you can see, it's 39 respondents who um, participated both in the pre and the post uh, study. Uh, there were 70 uh, people in all living in that building. Those are the people, no one refused, but those are the people who were able, could uh, respond to our questionnaires with some help. So everyone who could participate, participated that to all. Worked out to be 40 people around, with an average age of 86. So those 39 people had scores, ah, well, the layout of the slides is uh, screwed up, but anyway, this should be here. The average score before the change was 2.7 on the 5 on scale for aesthetic quality. It's, uh, it's uh, raised to well, 3.7, so a whole point difference. After the renovation, something similar, even stronger for the experience of controlled interaction that was substantially improved from before to after. Uh, not only that, and because we see also the use they make of the lobby increased, and especially this one is interesting that the uh, general degree of well-being, subjective well-being, improved half a point significantly um, just because of some changes in the lobby and the recreation room. <coughs> we can see the correlations of this ratings of quality post um, renovation with subjective well-being. And really strong. <coughs> so there's a strong relation between the experience of this particular part of the building after the change and their general degree of well-being. So important things can happen in an interior, especially for people who are so focused or so rely so much on that particular environment. Aesthetics, social interaction are 
to mentally important. Then uh, a final study that I did myself with some students, a couple of a couple of experiments, uh, coming from the idea that uh, well, restoration, stress, mental fatigue, restoration are important topics. Nature may play a role in that. Increase uh, recovery, restoration, but why should it also always be nature? Was the idea? People spend so much time in town, increasingly uh, many hours, and increasingly many people live in cities. More than half the world population now lives in cities. That's well, a new phenomenon in a way. <coughs> So it can all, cannot always be nature that we have to rely on for recovery and restoration. There should be urban options as well. So, what do people do when presence and accessibility of nature is limited, or when it's very poor weather or whatever? <coughs> In combination with the, with the, well, the, the finding that very many people enjoy themselves tremendously in urban leisure activities. So people do not go to nature so much and all the time for recovery, stress reduction probably. They have a good time in very urban um, circumstances. What happens there, for whom especially? And what do other people mean? Because one of the limitations of many of the recovery and restoration sites about nature is that there's very little attention to social context. I'm trying to change that and run a series of experiments now in which physical and social context is uh, manipulated, but so far there's very little attention for the social context of restoration. And, well, it's, uh, there's no need to argue that that is most probably a very important component. So I wanted to see what more urban uh, situations could mean in terms of recovery, stress recovery, attention on recovery. Um, in combination with well, the, the discussion I had with students came, led to the choice of a cafe, a cafe as a, um, an environment for leisure anyway, restoration possible. And that led us to the insight that norms are tremendously important, situational norms are tremendously important for what's going on in a certain place. And this is a quote from a philosopher saying that uh, the social context of a cafe is not just the liquor, not the beer, it's well, the people that make uh, an event like a cafe interesting, pleasant, and well, maybe leading to the kind of a norm that you should not be alone in a cafe. And that was the, the trigger for us to start working on experiments that manipulated company and mental fatigue. I present briefly two studies, in which those are uh, experimental and manipulated. Um, the first one, uh, both are well, scenario studies. People imagine themselves to be mentally fatigued or not. We checked whether they were able to do that. They said they could. We found out in other studies that real fatigue replicates studies of those kind of scenarios. So we had some confidence in our manipulations. And we uh, looked at a cafe with and without a reading table. I'll come to, him, come to that a little later about why the reading table. So uh, we had an interior with, with or without a reading table, and we had people that imagined to be mentally fatigued or alert, and were alone or in company, a company of a good friend. Students were the participants, and we looked at well, how much they liked the cafe, how much they thought it was stress reducing, <coughs> refreshing. We look particularly at uh, this variable, the seating choice, I'll show you how, and at the stress measure. So, this is the floor plan of the cafe that we showed to our participants. As you can see, it's, it's very realistic. It has tables here, it has tables here, a bar, a kitchen. And what it shows also is that many of the places, many of the seats are occupied in a way that it makes it not possible to be alone at one of the tables. You see everywhere people there. So, so the, our participant had to choose where to sit. In one condition that this floor plan 
the other condition we had this floor plan with a very subtle difference and that is um, of this nook of the cafe containing two tables or one long table labeled reading table. <coughs> uh, we came at the reading table option by well, just introspection and thinking about norms and about what is acceptable behavior in a cafe. The most viable behavior is well, talking, having fun with people you know or get to know there. But what if you're alone? Is it how pleasant it is to go into a cafe where you know, do not know anyone and where you're obliged to take a seat at a table that's already occupied? And does it make a difference if you're alone or in company? We argued, we, we thought at least that a meeting table might change the normative expectations of being in a cafe. The norm of well, socializing might be uh, changed to a more, more liberal one where more activities are acceptable for example reading so it's not such it's a strong north expectation that you should socialize that's why the reading there <coughs> results are pretty spectacular here you see the scores for the condition of being alert or not fatigued and fatigued you see that people alert do not care so much for a reading table. Here, scores are not significantly different. But here they are. Here you see the people who are fatigued or imagined to be fatigued have an outspoken preference for a cafe with a reading table compared to those who um, have a preference for a reading table cafe compared to the other people who saw the other floor plan without the reading table. So fatigue seems to play a role. That's even stronger the case for being in company or being alone. Being in company doesn't make a difference. There you prefer, highly prefer being in a cafe with or without a reading table. Relatively high scores, five on the seven point scale, and equal for the reading table or the no reading table condition. Well here there's an outspoken difference. Being alone in a cafe without a reading table is fairly unattractive while being alone in a cafe with a reading table is much better. Even better to be with a friend, but the reading table does, does well, quite a good job. Here it's um, the scores of well, what seat people would choose in each of the conditions, when they were alert or fatigued. So you see here, this is the percentage of people in this particular corner potential people that in this condition alert, no reading table, 20% chose to be in one of those tables. While um, in this condition, alert reading table, 50% chose to sit here, somewhere here. And this is even more strongly the case for the fatigued people. So the same for the no reading table condition as here, but a very strong shift towards the reading table in case of fatigue. So apparently for those people, this really makes a difference. And then again, a similar analysis for being alone or in company. As you saw also in the preference course, it doesn't make so much of a difference. People in company are not, uh, well, to some extent choose, 30% chooses a seat here, 40% chooses a seat here, no significant difference. But the effect for people alone is really spectacular. 10% chooses one of these seats, one of the three or four seats available here, while 80% chooses one of the same number of seats, same corner, slight difference in well, uh, status of that corner of the table in this condition. So here at the table, just the simple effect of installing a table that is labeled reading table it makes a real big difference. <clears throat> then we want to know why. Why is it exactly? We had some intuitions, of course, but we want to know for sure, more precisely, what's going on. So being alone in a cafe is not such a pleasant experience. A reading table can soften the effect, but in general, there's a fairly strong relation of being alone as compared to being others in terms of stress and low preference. 
And why is that the case? Why exactly? Same study, same, uh, same kind of design, careful with and without a reading table, people fatigued or not. Now it's just people alone, because we now know what people in company do. We don't care so much. Again, the student population, with the same kind of measures, likelihood of recovery, choice, and then this one, salient cognition. What did people think about those cafes? Same floor plan, corner with two tables, or the one big reading table, and the cognitions. What did we find about, well, what did people say about those kind of situations? We did a pilot study, came up with a number of potential causes and items. It might be that social uncertainty plays a role when, when you're alone, that you don't know what to do, where to leave your hands, where to look, such things. That you're, well, somewhat reluctant to disturb the privacy of others, because in all cases you have to sit at the table with others present. Uh, you might feel pathetic and lonely, just alone in a cafe where everybody has fun. And you might be aware of others' expectations to socialize, this especially normative expectation. Well, which one worked statistically? We found two uh, causes, two sets of cognitions explaining uh, the stress reaction. This one is uh, one of them. More than we thought was the disturbance of the privacy of others a reason to feel uncomfortable and to be stressed. So this direct relation is almost solved. It's very strong, 20 plus 22, significant. Well, we was being reduced to non-significance when you introduce this as a potential mediator. So it appears that well, the, the process is that, well, not, have, not sitting at the reading table leads to fear of disturbance of the privacy of others, which in turn leads to stress as one explanation, and yet more. The other one was indeed the pathetic and lonely feeling that may arise when you go to a cafe alone. So again, the direct relationship was reduced to non-significance by introducing the media. So it is indeed the case that feeling pathetic and lonely in such a cafe leads to stress. Well, an example of how, uh, well, uh, again, uh, an introduction of, in this case, a table uh, or a change of tables may lead to fairly outspoken psychological reaction, which you, what is good to know about and useful for designers. Coming to my general conclusions, the general one that physical and social characteristics of the environment determine possibilities, stress reduction, and restoration, the combination, the interaction. That subtle changes can be enough. And uh, finally, that psychology can really contribute in developing, testing, and evaluating environmental designs. That's why the title is an optimistic story. I think psychology can really do a lot of things in this uh, area of research where designers are so prominent and where there are so many options to change things. That's it. Thank you.